Okay. Good so, morning, everyone. Yeah, good morning. Uh, good morning. So, yeah, I think let's start. So, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Goddess of Certification uh, Session 6. Uh, today, we'll be talking about performance tuning. So, uh, there is a lot to know, a lot to know. So, let's start. Uh, I am Manmohan, I'm a Salesforce lead consultant uh, working with Infosys Limited in the Netherlands. Uh, I live in Holland and I am from in India. You can me on Twitter with Manmohan to Singh. You can also uh, connect with me on LinkedIn with Manmohan Singh Pal. Uh, and I'll be very happy um, getting in touch with you. So if you have any questions, queries, or want to connect with me, you are most welcome. So about uh, Decode as a certification, I think we started it uh, uh, last month. Uh, uh, we have a couple of uh, uh, nice speakers. Myself, Bhavna, who works for Echo Shoes in Netherlands. Uh, she's in a Salesforce consultant, uh, woman in tech uh, group leader uh, running uh, and helping the people. Uh, we have Harina Van Singh, who is a lead ID consultant uh, with a lot of knowledge in the Salesforce ecosystem. He has presented a couple of these sessions before. Uh, you can keep in touch with him as well on a LinkedIn uh, within Harin Nancy. And we have Vinay Sani, who is our domain architect working for Canon Euro. Uh, uh, Vinay is an application architect, system architect, uh, having a lot of Salesforce knowledge. Uh, you can keep in touch with him uh, on a LinkedIn as Vinay Sel. Uh, moving to the next, you so write about our group, Decoders of Certification. It is an unofficial Salesforce group. Uh, and then our focus is uh, to gain knowledge uh, uh, by discussing each other, uh, uh, taking advantage of each other's experience, knowledge uh, in this domain. And with this group, uh, we would like to invite everyone uh, to who they are from in a different uh, background, knowledge, and experience. But uh, this is in a platform where uh, we can help each other, we can learn from each other's, uh, we can learn from each other's experience. So this is in a platform uh, where we invite everyone and, and we try to learn from each other. Uh, about this uh, certification, so Salesforce Certified Data Architecture and Management Designer uh, course is basically designed for someone who's is in a data architect or planning to be in a data architect, technical architect, uh, who basically participate in a solution design, uh, solution architectures, and who are in a system administrator as well. So from an exam perspective, it is in a 60 uh, question, multiple choice uh, exam. Uh, you have around one and a, uh, around 105 minutes to take the exams. Passing score is slightly low, 67 percent. Uh, but then the reason for it is uh, the exam is focused on on the scenario-based questions, and then um, there would be a lot of tricks. So it is very important that you understand all the con concepts thoroughly. Uh, the registration fees is 400 USD. You already know that all the designers' certification are 400 USD, and then the retake. Uh, fees is 200 so nobody wants to pay the retake fee so it is very important to learn and understand the concept of free. so by this uh, 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 program uh, we have divided the sessions all into you know, eight different sessions the entire uh, syllabus of the exam um, today we are covering the performance tuning uh, uh, the concepts which can help you looking at the application performance and there is a possibility to improve the performance. Uh, some of the previous sessions uh, already covered by data archiving. Data. Last week you have heard you know, sharing a, a lot of deep analysis and the concepts. Uh, before that, Bhavna has presented uh, reporting analytics, data migration. Before to that, uh, Vinay has presented the data management, metadata management, and then uh, Hari presented the conceptual design that when you're designing, what all things keep in consideration, you should keep in mind. And then the first session I was I have presented, which was on a data modeling. So with today's session, we are going to cover almost all these labors. And then uh, hopefully uh, by this week, there are a lot of guys asking about uh, the recordings. So we'll also try to publish the recording so that you have access to all the sessions previous sessions, including the today's one. And then we will have two more revision sessions. Uh, as I requested last time, we haven't heard from anybody that the topics they want us to cover as part of the revision. So please do share your feedback. Uh, if you see the content uh, which we have covered, uh, you want to go through one more time, or the content which you want to 
uh, go through we have not covered as part of uh, this series you can also share those kind of feedback and based on uh, feedbacks uh, we'll try to uh, cover the revision sessions so revision sessions are mostly uh, would be based on the questions we'll try to find out some sample questions and we'll debate a little bit around it and see that how good we have understood the concept so uh, moving next so this is how our wagon wheel looks like uh, today i'm going to perform the performance training part and then you see that the batteries will be covered in the almost fully and uh, complete 100 uh, percent uh, weightage of the exam so let's start so as today's session is uh, we're going to talk about the performance so what i'm starting with this slide to present is uh, what happens when you have an uh, uh, performance issues so if you have a system where you see the poor performance or poor performances in terms of the skin takes on a longer time to load sometimes you get a uh, time of issues uh, user, your user complains that uh, uh, taking the pictures are taking longer time some of the user says okay it's working for me some of the user says uh, i don't know what's wrong with my system uh, it, it never works for me or even if it works sometime so you see in a behavior of the applications uh, are different for the different users geolocation so we'll talk about it today a little bit and then sometimes we have an scalability challenges as well where we are uh, we are not able to uh, scale the application so these two uh, are the key important factors which triggers to your performance tuning now what it takes it takes analysis and rework uh, in order to find out these gaps which can um, which can uh, take the additional cost to do the analysis and sometime as part of your analysis it will also result as additional work uh, which means it can impact your increased delivery timelines and your increased overall project cost and then to compensate it sometime you reduce your features which means that uh, it has impact to your brand reputations uh, your users or employees adoption uh, and also impact to the other infrastructure's cost and delays because sometimes uh, your Salesforce is talking to a different uh, systems and delay to Salesforce means delay everywhere. Uh, sometimes you see that uh, some of the guys say, okay, Salesforce is not capable tool. They talk about comparing it with Microsoft Dynamics, with Pega CRM and other CRM system. Mm -hmm. So though you have a very good tool, sometimes it also um, creates a lack of trust in the product. And of course, the customer dissatisfaction as well. So we'll see about uh, today that what uh, what are the uh, key areas where when you are looking at the performance tuning, you should focus on, and then we'll see what are the recommendations where you can look at your system, you can increase the performance. So moving to the slide, this slide. So I have spent some time on this slide uh, to understand uh, what can impact uh, to your performance. Now, if you see, there are uh, two circles. One is an outer circle, one is an inner circle. So there are things on uh, the outer circle which uh, impacts your performance from an outside. And there are certain things which you can do within the sales force. So both can cause your performance. Uh, I will focus more on the things which you can control within the sales force, but we'll, keep, uh, uh, we'll little bit discuss about the external impacts as well. So uh, if you see if your network and a Wi-Fi signal strength is not good, it may impact your uh, system performance because Salesforce is a cloud solution. So if you see uh, there, is an, uh, there is an impact to your uh, uh, system's performance, uh, definitely you need to look at your network and Wi-Fi signal strength. You should really have a very good uh, network in order to access any of the cloud application. Uh, your laptop and a desktop configuration also matters. So if you have a high performance systems, you may get a you know, better results. So make sure that you look at your laptop and a desktop, you see kind of a you know, software installed on it, uh, which are the softwares which are not being used from in a longer time. And then uh, uh, what I do generally when I see uh, that system is not performing well, I generally check uh, the CPU utilization and the memory utilization and see which program is eating it like up. And I try to either kill those threads or in process if possible. So, of course, uh, when you are looking at overall your sales force performance, and if you have a job to do an analysis, definitely this is an area where you need to look at 
as an architect you cannot ignore it and then uh, your browsers are very important salesforce has certain recommendations around uh, browsers uh, so when you are having a challenge in terms of performance you definitely have to have a look at uh, your browsers uh, and your browser settings uh, make sure uh, it, it is compliance with uh, the salesforce recommendations so definitely before you look at your implementation you also look at uh, the browsers used by the users i frequently see this issue when one of the user complains that says that uh, it's not working for me then the other user says no i i say it's fine it's working uh, absolutely correct so uh, your browser can definitely be check your installed mal malwares uh, uh, if you have in the system and try to try to get an good um, uh, uh, software to remove all those uh, as i said installed software is also matter which because they can eat up your memories so please pay attention to that that the softwares which are no longer in use or you are rarely using it and if you have an, an option to remove those remove it from a system so that is again a part of your laptop and that stop configuration and then the interesting part is user location so sometimes your user location can uh, play in a, a role we will definitely talk about this uh, it is an uh, important aspect so if an, a user sitting uh, in india and a user sitting in the us and a user sitting in the europe uh, accessing to the same salesforce environment they may see an upper performance difference because uh, of the geolocation and because of your data center so the users close to the data center may have a better performance compared to the users who are sitting far from the data center and then uh, uh, at the status.salesforce.com uh, to check your uh, environment uh, uh, health check your availability of your application and uh, sometime what happens right there if there is an uh, upgrade is going on you may have impact to your uh, application and then uh, you just need to know that okay what time is going to happen so sometimes this also helps you to communicate your users uh, that they may have a performance impact during that period so that gives kind of a confidence to them that this is nothing to do with your application it is more about an upgrade going on so status.salesforce.com i generally log in and keep eye on it so this is about the, the things which you can uh, uh, pay attention from an outside and then there are the certain things which we definitely talk about today is uh, uh, within the application which you need to look at is the best practices and the recommendations uh, from a salesforce how your salesforce or application is configured uh, how you have used your automation using the flows also with the validation automations, drivers and then how you are managing your data using big object objects um, if you are dealing with the large data volume, what kind of configuration setup you have. So this is all about the key uh, pointers which you need to keep in mind when you are looking about on performance tuning. Uh, each one of these uh, can have an, a major impact, um, and therefore it can impact your user. Uh, as uh, for an example, let's say if you don't have a very good Wi-Fi network, it may frustrate your users. So there is nothing to do with your application configuration then bad uh, internet can uh, can uh, impact definitely uh, experience now moving to the next slide uh, as i said i will just touch upon about the things which will uh, impact from an outside because i think that's not going to help from an exam perspective uh, uh, it is more about good to know from a knowledge perspective so uh, well, if you have a slow performance, uh, the first thing is check your internet speed. Uh, this is a general thing. Uh, uh, you can check it. There are so many available which tells about what kind of subscription you have and uh, what kind of speed you are getting. Uh, uh, there are sometimes uh, settings of your browsers or installed application. Sometimes of your browser extensions can eat up your speed and then it may impact your results. So the first step is definitely you look at your internet speed, talk to your provider, adjust your Wi-Fi, uh, uh, sometime place uh, of your Wi-Fi location inside your house or an office can give you a better result. And then the rest of the things I think we already spoke about, you need to check your memory RAM, check you have the right browser, you clean your browsers, uh, be careful about extensions, especially uh, Firefox and Chrome, they provide a lot of extensions and these extension can eat up your uh, your speed. 
So I will not go about it. Uh, there are so many articles about it. It's good to know uh, being in a solution designer and an architect. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, is it is it better now, Hari? It's not. Are you able to hear me well? Because there is no point. I I continue and you are not able to hear me. Yeah, it's there is an echo. Uh, I'm not sure, if Racha, if you can go and mute. Uh, that may improve. Okay, let me put her on mute. Thanks, Hari, for uh, letting me know that there is a problem with the voice. Okay. Good. This is much better, much better. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, so I will, as I said, I will not go through it because uh, this is nothing to do with your our exam, which we going to attempt. But uh, definitely, uh, it is good to know because it is important uh, for you as a solution designer and architect to understand that you do do not jump into your Salesforce application right away when you have a bad performance reported by your user or a set of user. You definitely have to have a look. Uh, from an outside, uh, uh, Hari is complaining that we still have an echo. Let me just check my audio setting once here. Yeah? Just give me one second. Uh, sure. How about it? This is good. This is good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Hari. Um, I think I should have done it before, but then, okay. Let's continue. So, what I'll do is I will resume the recording. Okay. So, what I was talking about is uh, this part, which says, uh, you need to check the external factors about your performance tuning. So uh, definitely go ahead and read some of the articles. It will give you a good understanding from an outside perspective. Uh, now let's let's move on to the area which is important from an exam perspective. Uh, so this is an uh, article uh, about your browser settings. Uh, it is important to read it. Uh, I will not go through much in detail, but then as I was talking about Salesforce also gives another recommendations that uh, which browser you should use and then what should be your uh, settings. Some of the important points are given here, especially about TLS settings. So make sure your, your browser is enabled to uh, TLS 1.2. Uh, if it's not available, at least TLS 1.1. If you do not enable any of these, then uh, most probably the Salesforce will not be able to work. Or even if it works, it may not load all the content. So this setting is very important. And if you are using the Lightning, some of the launch program and files uh, in a frame security settings you needs to be enabled. Uh, you should not block the third party cookies and the site data. Um, and then your screen resolution should be as per the recommendation. I will not go through much in detail. I have given links of these uh, articles. You go through it. It's it's good to read. Now moving to the next slide. Uh, uh, let's discuss about uh, what could impact uh, when some of your users says that uh, uh, they are not able to access the page or the page performance is slow. Uh, I I hear this uh, very frequently uh, from. Uh, my users that uh, someone says that uh, the page is working for me the other one says it's not working for me and then we say have you tried the different system have you tried from a different laptop uh, is it working fine and things like that we do uh, so let's look at uh, this scenario closely now if you have an internet performance issues right as and let's say the you the end user comes to you what you can do and how you can basically look into into the situation and and what all the steps you can perform in order to drill down and find out that there is a real performance issue or you can justify back that we have performed the test and there is no uh, perform 
performance issue everything is working fine so you need definitely in a test around it you need an evidence uh, sample data which can prove that uh, uh, the things are working fine and therefore we are going to discuss about this today little bit in detail so what steps you can perform is have at least two almost identical systems um, when I say identical, it means they have a similar kind of an, a, a configuration. The browser settings are something similar. And then uh, you try to have two or more different locations, accessing it by two and different locations. Because in that case, you can understand the uh, that uh, person who is sitting to your data center versus person who is sitting far from your data center. Uh, is that uh, network playing a role into it? And then uh, uh, there are uh, uh, tools available in the market uh, which uh, if you are not able to find an, a location which is far from your data center you can have an, uh, uh, tools which can artificially add uh, latency and a bandwidth difference uh, to it but if not most important is you at least try to have two systems which are almost same and then uh, ask your users to sit behind the system and then you need to set up set up your debug logs for each of these users because based on the debug logs you're going to get some of the samples and then give them in a target page it could be in a visual force page uh, or it could be your salesforce out of the box screens which can result in a workflows triggers and uh, maybe bouncing the process builders. So you can target what kind of an, a page or an application you want to target in order to get the performance. Uh, ideally, we do it for an, a custom things. So for an, our example today, we'll be taking a visual first page. And then uh, when you are going to measure it, uh, make sure that you use the same tool. So I am going to cover today the developer console and I'm sure that you're going to love it. Uh, but there are many other tools available which you can uh, use for the measurement uh, uh, in which you will be tracking the activities, actions, uh, time taken by each action and how those uh, particular methods, queries are performing. And then we'll try to take on a multiple test samples, uh, which, which will tell you, you can average it out and then that will give you a confidence that uh, you have tested it in a different time uh, or peak hours or peak hours, uh, maybe uh, the evening times, the morning time when the load is not there. So take on a multiple samples, uh, try to involve two users and more than two users. Uh, uh, make sure that they follow the same steps. Uh, you are setting the right debug logs and once all these tests are done, analyze the result and take the corrective action, which could be reducing the payload and reducing the network latency. So we'll we'll see today uh, in the demo that how we're gonna uh, uh, do it. Now before I go there, uh, before I I go to the reducing the payload, uh, let let me show you in a sample that uh, how you can test it. Just give me a second. So what I'll do is I will log into a Salesforce and then I will try to hit an available force page to give you a demonstration on it. Anybody on the call have tried it before? I did that. Okay. Anybody who did it, uh, checking the performance, because I remember in my last project, uh, I had an issue where uh, some of the triggers, uh, when it was getting fired, I was getting into too many SQL queries issue. And then uh, I've been asked to look into that. And I really find it difficult to, to see that how many classes are running behind. I think there was a question also on the previous session. Somebody asked that. Uh, uh, how do we know that uh, which method, which uh, query is being executed and how many times it's being executed? So, uh, looks like my system is a little bit hanging. Sorry about that. You guys are still able to hear me, right? We can hear you, but we see the slide. We don't see the, the screen of the... Yeah, because it's kind of little hanged. Uh, looks like performance issue with my system. 
Okay, so just give me one minute. Uh, guys, in case if you just kicked out of the Webex, please try to rejoin using the same. I'm trying to see what went wrong with my system. Okay. So, hope you are able to see my screen now. Yes. It's good now. Okay. okay, it's good now, yeah. So, how many of you use the developer console on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah. So what I've done is uh, I have opened my developer console. I don't see a log here. Um, I'm I'm sure hope you know how to set and um, uh, set up the debug logs. So I'm not going to cover that part. But what I'll do is uh, I will go and upload an Visual Force page, uh, which uh, will uh, create some logs behind, uh, and then we'll try to see uh, the performance. That how you can check the performance. Okay, so this is my page, uh, which has some sample data. Uh, I have just put a few queries behind it. And you see there is an, a log generated. Now, what your job is as an architect to understand and read the logs. Uh, now, what you can do is uh, when uh, you come to a developer console, you come to your debug and then you open the view log panels. Uh, I don't know whether you have used this before, but this is going to give you an, a lot of view. Now, the first one is your Slack uh, trace, uh, which gives you an execution tree and execution performance tree. So if you look at here, all these durations are in a milliseconds, right? So if you see here, it tells you that there are there is a class in which we have a sales aggregate method, uh, which is being executed multiple times and each iteration, how much time it has taken. So if I show you the code, yeah, this is my method. Yeah, this is my method, get results and sales aggregate. Now what it is doing is, it is looking at these operations behind it. So you can see it, uh, how much time I have to select queries. One is taking 9.27 milliseconds, 16.03 milliseconds. So if somebody asks you which query is taking longer time, you can right away tell them that there are two queries used in the system. The one is this, and the other one is the opportunity list. So if we look at here, it can clearly tell you uh, the uh, time taken by each, and then we have an, a, a sales aggregate method which tells that each iteration how much time it's taking to. So there are two things, execution tree and execution uh, uh, performance tree. Uh, this does not tell you about the aggregate, but it tells you about the overall time. So looking at this, you can see the overall 1. 155 milliseconds taken by this page to load. And then you can see that uh, every milliseconds performed by it. So this is in a first step where you can look at and see uh, uh, from a performance tuning perspective that uh, which query is being executed, how long it is taking, is there an, a need for an improvement in the query? Because uh, when you have a, a big program, uh, could be in a lot of queries and few queries are really written in a bad way. So right away you can see and see, okay, this particular query is taking on a longer time. What's wrong here? Or maybe in a loop or in a method, you can see, okay, this method is taking a lot of uh, time. Uh, let's go inside this method and see what's causing wrong here, yeah? So this is in a one area where you can go and look at it. Now the second part of this is, let me show you, there are many more important things here. Now if you go, any question? Was there a question for me? No, no, there is no question. Actually, Karnakar, can you go on mute, please? That's great, thank you. Yeah. And then uh, you can also look at the execution overview. 
um, which is in a very important feature of it. Now, this will give you a very good understanding. Uh, and I'm sh I'm sure that um, you must have this kind of analysis. analysis. So let's say sometime what happens is uh, you update and record which fire uh, the trigger of that object and that cause certain workflows to be fired and a process builder to be fired and then they further on uh, uh, impact the different triggers. Uh, so and then some of the records get saved. So here you can see all the DML operations, uh, though in my example, it's not there. But if you come here, it will show you all the orders in which your program has performed. Uh, and then uh, it will also give you an, uh, uh, limits. So if you are using uh, DML operations, it will tell you that uh, uh, what was the hierarchy of the DML operations performed, uh, which particular method is co consuming a lot of DML operations, where actually you have hit the too many SQL queries and things like that. Uh, timelines basically tells you uh, it is in a good view. It tells you that which portion uh, of the loading is taking on a longer time. So if, if you look at here, uh, you can see the visual force is taking 10.67% of the overall time, which is 119 uh, milliseconds overall of 5.14. Uh, now, if you see here, this tells you the good presentation about that how long your visual force page has taken and it is in these 0 0.01 seconds. So if you have a performance impact, you may select the scale of one second, which will tell you that, okay, which particular option is taking a longer time. You see, we have no workflow fired, so there is nothing coming up here. Uh, there is no call out, uh, there is no validations, but if you see the, the validation also has taken some time, it will give you a presentation. So please make sure you make use of it. Uh, this is a very important powerful tool uh, in order to uh, check your debug logs, uh, checking the performance, because if you, if you look at the raw logs, uh, it won't be possible for you to find it out that easily. And the most important part is uh, execution unit. So as soon as I clicked on it, you see some of the buttons coming up over here. Now what this are doing over here is, uh, you see it has everything. There is a method which is called, there is two queries which are done. There is a page load method. There is again uh, two other methods. So two methods, two query, one page. And it tells you the sum taken by it. Now somebody asked me that, let's say if, there isn't a method in which you have a query and that method is being called by, maybe you have written a query in a for loop, right? And you have a say 100 Apex classes to find out. How would you find out that which class and which method is faulty? You can come here and check the count. If your queries counts are high, you can definitely go back to that query and see why there isn't a count so high. It means the method which is having this query is called multiple times and that is where it is not giving the right results. So this page gives you a very good view about everything. Now, in real world, this data will not look like that simple. You will have here some 100, 200, 300, 400 entries. And let's, if you only want to focus on queries, you just uh, unselect all those operations and it will only give you the queries. And if you really want to focus on the workflows uh, in case, then you just go and say, I am only interested in workflows. So by this, I can confidently say that no workflow has been fired. Yeah. So this is an important view, uh, which helps you to understand uh, which particular method, which particular class, which particular triggers, uh, uh, process builder uh, involved behind uh, the performance and who's taking the maximum time behind it. Uh, so before I move on to the uh, next topic, guys, do you have any question on it or anybody want to add more uh, about it if they have used it, uh, things like that, or do you have any question for me? Um, actually, the thing is I want to add a few things. Plus, uh, maybe a stupid question for a non-technical person. What are call-outs? Uh, the call-outs are where you uh, make an uh, operations outside Salesforce. Ah, okay. So it means that uh, doing an API call. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, um, 
maybe to add uh, in lightning um, for pages so just for example you actually check the visual force perf performance page from the developer console but uh, in lightning there is something which is coming out of the box then can all that is something which can also be used and i'm not sure if you can i can walk you through and that may be useful for other people as well if you want to uh yeah yeah if you want to share your screen yeah please go ahead uh, or, or you okay i'll i'll do that then yeah. and meantime uh, good that uh, hari you are sharing your experience from an lighting perspective uh, anybody else have done something similar kind of analysis analysis um, um this is uh, fergal here um one of the aspects that that we seem to have issues with is understanding the uh, severity based on a number is quite difficult for for different people so is there any guideline in terms of what is the severity as we're talking about milliseconds here and um, and that's one of those questions that that actually I get as well. Uh, when do you really need to go in and, and adapt the code based on on a number? Uh, so as said, there is no threshold, uh, especially uh, in terms of an execution. We do have a threshold from uh, from an query optimizer, which I'm going to cover uh, after this. Uh, but what uh, you need to look at is. Um, if your pages are frequently taking a little bit longer time let's say more than a more than a second to load it i have personally seen the visual force pages which can take up to two seconds three seconds even five seconds six seconds and what users generally do in that case is they try to refresh the page and see something has gone wrong so if you have a longer performance uh, and page are still working you can do on a performance tuning uh, there are a scenario where you definitely hit the error right away which says the cpu time limit Seed, or you have hit the too many SQL queries, then that is you no know, end of the road. You definitely need to come here and see the logs. Thanks for that. Are you good? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Shall I give you the presenter? Yeah. Uh, share my screen and let me know when you see. Are you able to see my screen now? Uh, yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, in Lightning, so the thing is, uh, the moment you go in setup, uh, you see this uh, tab over here, Lightning Usage. And Lightning Usage is going to give you a lot of information. It is actually going to give you information like uh, how your adoption is going for the lightning, but there is one more important thing which is going to be very, very helpful if combined with the developer console thing, what you showed one moment. If you click over here, what this page shows is that usage of your every single lightning component plus a visual force page as well. So this actually shows for the most few pages, which has been, so this is my, dev, uh, my developer org, my demo org. So you may be seeing a different, picture but if you see here that the pages if these are used so these are the most viewed pages for last seven days and this is the performance of the page so here you can see that how much time it is taking so just for example in one page just for example aloha page setup over here if this is taking a lot of time that is something which you can see over here plus there is another graph where you can drill down to the page itself so uh, just a use case so just for example there is one of a page which is not performing then what you can do is you can see here and uh, you can see that what is the performance of that page has been from last seven days is it because of something which is there within the system just for example the way manmohan showed that the page is making call out um, to the external system or there are queries running or there is something a method which is taking a lot of time so that is something which can you can take it up uh, this can be used in two ways first way is is that when you are building a custom component custom lightning component you can see the performance of the page that how that is behaving plus the moment it goes into production you can analyze your components uh, on a weekly basis or all on a monthly basis and then you can further take the action that okay this page is not performing and you have to make the changes and then you can combine your further analysis what manmohan has showed you so that is the way you can further refine your system for the performance. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, thanks, Hari. Guys, uh, any any one want to have a question? I think it's a very interesting topic. Uh, so uh, if you have done something similar before, please uh, 
do share your feedbacks your experience because uh, then everybody will get a chance to uh, learn from your experience as well um, hi man one hi ari abhishek here so even i'm using this a lot but the only challenge with this actually this is very useful but the challenge is we cannot drill down uh, if it is 7 days um, actually i am i recently reached out to salesforce to identify if there is something which can be exported uh, or uh, if we can drill down to another one more level deep so as if now i think that is not something which is there um, okay at the same okay. time it is not available in sandbox uh it is available in sandbox yes okay uh, yes, i created a sandbox and there it was not there as yes, because uh, maybe uh, for in full copy sandbox for sure it is there now uh, the developer sandbox is something which is giving me a question so i need to check in developer but in full sandbox for sure it is there uh, because i checked in full and also developer sandbox i couldn't find it but okay it can be different but because yeah that's something which i checked i think two days ago in my full copy and it was not there uh so okay what i'll do is i'll i'll in the background the so manmohan can continue with the uh, session and in the background i'll check it and i can confirm you but it's it's a good point that uh, we should be able to extract that yeah um cool i'll i'll check it and manmohan can continue with it yeah yep sure sure thank you okay yeah thanks hari okay so let me just take the control back and share my screen meantime i have also fixed my performance issues <laughs> okay so let me bring back the presentation part okay so i uh, hope this is clear to everyone right that how to use this tool uh, and then these execution overview is very important in order to debug these kind of an uh, performance things now once you have this analysis once you have these samples uh, uh, you can make an a decision that what you want to do um, uh, the areas where you want to uh, put more efforts around it uh so that is something which you can uh, you can look at uh there are other things about the visual force pages which you should avoid uh, and i have learned it recently is uh, uh you can you can reduce your payload basically uh, so basically look at your uh, content on the page for example right uh, you have which are very heavy uh, and then you have an, a, a lot of images on a page please try to uh, to get rid of those images if those are really really not necessary uh, if possible try to see if you can cover it by by css which really makes uh, page easier do not put on a lot of uh, data on your page try to do an paginations and then uh, uh, html tags uh, which are not necessary comments which are not necessary white spaces which are not necessary you can take all those outs uh, which will definitely improve your performance and then there are visual force best practices practices uh, which anyway i will cover it next uh, in some of the slides so i will not go through those but the most important thing is uh, you try to reduce your payload which will help you uh, getting rid of your performance issues once you have an example this is an interesting slide uh, related to to data center uh, i think i should have presented it before but what it says is uh, uh, if your users are sitting on a different locations uh, where your Uh, IT and networking team can help with the uh, Salesforce support team. So you need not to do anything within the Salesforce directly, but this is more about your network issues, uh, where you can uh, you can install a tool which basically perform these uh, uh, data latency uh, performance of how your connections is doing. So you can check how your uh, your routing. is happening how your packets are going uh, are they following uh, the shortest route is that an stable path uh, when a packet is lost uh, uh, is your program really waiting longer for that package to be you know received uh, the failure reports are coming uh, is there an abort bottlenecks because of the redirects within your application Uh, so this is something which i also wanted to highlight that uh, when your data center uh, is in a one particular city and some of the users are sitting across the globes uh, they can have a different uh, experience because uh, uh, if you see that all your data is not distributed 
among the multiple data centers your data is always stored uh, on a one single data center uh, your data may go to a different data center as a backup and a disaster recovery but that is in a different case but in terms of your live data it always sits into one single data center and if your users are across the globe uh, they may have an a uh, uh, net they may have an impact issue because of the network so that is where if you are in a solution designer you may involve your local uh, it team networking team and a salesforce support team in order to find out the unstable paths uh, in terms of if there are the packets are lost and they can carefully investigate and change your router preferences uh, security setting and things like that um, i'm not sure if there will be a, a question uh, in the exam on this but it is interesting to know okay so with this we discussed about uh, things uh, which uh, you can do with uh, the uh, query with the optimizer tool now let's little bit look at your soql which is now we are coming inside the salesforce part so let's discuss about uh, uh, your soql queries how your soql queries uh, are written how your soql queries are performed we have seen uh, how this would be uh, 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 this would be uh, we discussed about right that if you have uh, numbers if you have an account if your query is taking a longer time to perform uh, what you can do with that query what could go wrong with it and i think there was a question also on a threshold that how would we calculate in threshold so i have tried uh, finding this detail and putting here on the slide so the first.com query optimizer and a threshold so first.com query optimizer is in a is in an engine which we don't see but it sits somewhere between uh, when you write your sql or you write your report and a list view what it does it it looks at your content and the query and then it try to see if it is really optimized so it it is sits somewhere between uh, your database and uh, the queries you have you have written uh, query optimizer also checks the number of records targeted by the filter against the selective thresholds so there is a formula which is salesforce has given what this is is it is really important when you use an a standard index field or versus the custom uh, fields now if you are using the standard field uh, what it says is 30% of the first million targeted records and 15% of the records thereafter from the first million records so for example let's say if you have two and five million records taking an example if you have two and five million of account records and your query is having a, a standard index field in it as part of a criteria what it will check is it will check the 30 percent of the first of million which is around 300k and remaining 1.5 million would be considered with the 50 percent so therefore they come up with the number of 525k records which would be your threshold uh, your definitely query should not go beyond that and for in a custom case this threshold is set little bit low because what they said is the first million takes 10 percent where it was 30 percent and remaining would be calculated by five percent so this is about your uh, when you are writing query uh, uh, keep that in mind uh, you understand the threshold and uh, you also understand that uh, how important it is to use your filters and queries now some of the index field i think bhavna on previous session she has covered it uh, we'll go through it one more time because it is important from your performance perspective uh, so the there are some standard index field uh, like your ids including the master detail relationships or on a lookup end of the day these are all ids uh, your name fields your owner id is again an id a uh, created date system mode stamp last modified date is is something uh, uh, last modified date is something which is not uh, uh, indexed i was surprised with that but yes that is what documentation says uh, we do definitely use in our queries last modified date but going forward i'll keep that in in mind and instead of last modified date uh, i will try to use uh, system modified stamp or other fields which can help uh, which can help in terms of making the queries more good but i think the last modified definitely we frequently use and which index so it could have an error system performance and all of the unique fields so they have given the documentation some of the bad examples which we should uh, should not put if we are trying to do a, a, a soql uh, a performance optimization uh, 
for example right equal to null is something which definitely this query is going to take long time uh for example here we have written not equal to new uh so if we have five or six different stages uh, status uh, putting it not equal to new uh, is something which salesforce do not recommend instead of that what they say is use the in uh, operator and then you can put uh, all these stages which are uh, considered in and something like uh, like is also uh, not correct which because it it takes uh, it will go through a lot of records scanning each record putting it to that criteria and see and some of the operators like uh, greater than equal to not equal to uh, sh also create some time and a problem now uh, by reading this uh, frank uh, i got a little bit confused now question is how would you know your query is good or not anybody tried this before uh, finding it out how would you ensure so let's say if i am a developer and you are an architect and uh, uh, you say that uh, you review my code and said that my query is bad how would how would if i ask you a question can you prove why it's bad how would you do that the cost of the query okay good we can get the cost of the queries and uh, uh, have you used the tool to get it i have used developer console okay fantastic abhishek so i am going to to go there uh, anybody else okay so as abhishek said developer console is a very powerful tool it also gives us an uh, ability uh, where uh, we can we can uh, get the cost of the queries and uh, based on that we can see right if the queries are really optimized good to use not to good not good to use and things like that so i will cover that as part of but before that uh, 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 i would like to cover this uh, slide this also we have discussed on the previous session when bavna was presenting it uh, it talks about when you are working with the large sql queries uh, uh, make sure that uh, you do not put a uh, lot of uh, heavyweight queries directly into into your uh, system by putting a select because it eats up all your heap space and that slow downs your performance better to put it uh, within your for loop uh, and then it does in a kind of an internal pagination which makes your your queries uh, lightweight so if you are dealing with the large data volume please make sure that you use it uh, and then we have three functions which i think we also spoke on a previous session uh, query query all and query more query generally we already use right which returns uh, the targeted uh, data based on these specified uh, filter criteria uh, query all is in a query which uh, returns uh, the archive data as well is in a read only mode uh, so based on any use case you can make query more uh, uh, moreover does like in a pagination where it takes in a default 500 records and then it always keep checking the you know uh, uh, is last flag uh, in terms of done flag uh, is equal to true or not and then it will be giving you data in a iteration mode so if you are dealing with the large data uh, make sure you can make use of it uh, and then based on that you can decide your system uh, i will not go much in detail i'm sure we have covered in the previous session so more i am interested to talk about is this which uh, abhishek was talking about now again this is our developer console tool uh, what it does it uh, uh, it will when you write in a query uh, it will tell you the uh, the cost of the query so couple of things you need to understand uh, on this so first of all how can you find it so if you go to the help and preferences let me just show you how many guys have used this before other than abhishek anyone else okay so definitely good topic to cover okay so if we go to help and preferences uh, by default this does not come true so make sure your enable query plan as true and once you enable this just refresh your developer console uh, under the log editor you will see this additional button will come query plan now what this offers you is as abhishek said right uh, it will give you the cost of the query and the cost can be uh, less than one and more than one uh, abhishek uh, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but the, any query which is cost is more than one is considered to be uh, revised to be something which you should consider and pay attention to it. Uh, it gives a couple of more things about uh, leading operations time. What it talks about it, it has two values. Uh, one, it will tell you indexed and one table scan index is the query will be using an index uh, uh, filter on the query and if it is in a table scan then uh, uh, it will not consider I guess uh, the uh, index field and then cost is something which tells you uh, if it is greater than one then definitely you need to look at then we have an as a object uh, cardinality which talks about total number of records targeted so if you are firing a query and which is uh, targeted on a 500k records it will show you in 500k records uh, and then the object which you are uh, doing here uh, cardinality will tell you the uh, output number of records uh, uh, on it. So let's try to see an example of an, a good query and a bad query. Okay, so I have tried it a couple of times making some samples for you yesterday. So let's say for example, I have this query which says uh, select ID, create a date name from an account where ownership equal to public or ownership is equal to private. Now what I'll do is I will just execute this query and go to the plan. Yeah. Now, if you see here, it says in a table scan because I have not used any index field and cost is more than one. Yeah. Because now I have a 12 records in the system out of which only two qualify for this uh, condition. But if we look at it, uh, if we look at it, uh, you see that the cost is high, right? And some this is something which you can optimize. Wherever if I use in a uh, queries which are based on an ID, for example, this uh, you can execute this query and you can say query plan. You see the uh, the cost of this query is very very low. Yeah, so this is in a tool uh, which you can use in order to find out the cost. Uh, Abhishek, you want to add anything more because you have used it? I think that's good. The most important point is it has to be selective query. The more we keep it open ended. Uh, cost is high and it will ultimately impact the performance. Yeah, exactly. So even if, as Abhishek said, it should be selective, but even if you know sometime your developer writes a lot of queries and you are in under pressure to check it, this is in a best tool. You come put a query here and see that how your query is performing. And if your query is bad and that is written in a loop or that is written in a method which is executed multiple times, then you know, right, where is the most of the uh, execution time or your performance is going. So these are some of the tools out of the box available in Salesforce, which you can make use of it. Uh, very helpful. Uh, and then definitely it will help you uh, understand uh, your system performance and then giving you a, some kind of an, a sample where uh, you can look at your data and you can improve the overall performance of it. Okay, now. I have a question regarding the, uh, the, the query planner. But the thing is, uh, the real data is available in, uh, in uh, full copy sandbox and also in production. Performance, uh, the picture may not be right, yeah? You can run it on your uh, uh, full copy sandbox. You can also run it in production. Okay, so it means, oh yeah, okay. Developer console, you can use it on the production as well. Yeah, indeed. Yeah? Okay. So even so if... Uh, some of the developers don't have access to production, so they have to work with some people to check that. Okay. Okay. Yes, you are true from that perspective. Yes, but then they can they can perform it on uh, staging, which is in a kind of in a, a full copy sandbox, which can give you a near a real example. Uh, I think that should be also okay, Hari. Yeah, but definitely a very powerful tool uh, uh, when you need to do an anal analysis that definitely can give you uh, some results which uh, can help you improving the performance. Uh, ideally, we should tell all our developers to make sure that they uh, check the cost of the query uh, every time. Uh, I don't know how, uh, how many guys follow it. Abhishek, do you follow in your project this as in a practice? I try to follow as much as possible. Sometimes developer do 
Uh, okay, so you do use it uh, when you actually developing around things, yeah, or reviewing code. Yeah, make use. But hundred percent of time it is not possible. Also, sometimes it just sometimes it gets skipped or yeah, such thing. Yeah, true. It's not always so. Your your developer should have a discipline actually. So we can definitely put it. Uh, I mean, um, as in a uh, we can educate our developers, making sure that they put it. I think most of the guys don't know it because these are the hidden features of developer console. Um, I personally feel um, that sometime we should go and uh, give in a very good demo or hidden uh, feature of a developer console to our developers that will add value i am going to have an, a session on it or at least on a video on all the developer console hidden features uh, so definitely it is it is in a good tool to tell your developers that they can go and make use of it okay so so far we discussed about uh, uh, impacts which can cause your performance outside Salesforce, like networks, uh, your data centers, your users' locations, their browser settings. Uh, we discussed about uh, performance of your SQL queries uh, and then the query tool optimizers. Uh, now let's discuss a little bit about best practices for optimizing Visual for Force page performance. Uh, as I said, right, the first uh, yeah, so I uh, the first important thing is I think there are topics which we are going to talk about you know already, but then uh, some of the generic thing I have not tried to put here something which I thought really interesting to discuss and talk about I have put it here, but I know there are a lot of uh, articles uh, talks about visual force best practices and optimization. So uh, uh, if you really want to know more, you can Google around. There are a lot of articles around it, but some of the interesting topics points I have put it here, which I find it makes sense to go through one more time. So uh, the first thing is it's useful images and then a smaller background texture and use CSS instead of an image whenever possible. So if I will tell you my personal experience, I have seen developers um, if they need any symbol, right? Like for an essay button, uh, if instead of a button, we want to show in a symbol, uh, things like that, right? And a flag, uh, a country flag, uh, or maybe uh, play and pause buttons somewhere, right? Next, move forward, things like that. What generally developer does it? They download an images and reduce, uh, and then put that by setting the image size on your Visual Force page. Now, what it does it, and I have done this myself as a developer, uh, but I have learned later that it is causing the performance. So when you review your code make sure that uh, your visual force page how many images it's referring to and pay attention to those images and see if really you really need images for those kind of things can you replace it by css uh, uh, and then uh, there are a lot of powerful css available mark which gives in a lot of symbols even a salesforce labs provides you in a uh, app exchange which you can refer to but most important thing is these visual force page if you have an image for an a button let's for example right uh, uh, you have an a button where you want to show the flags uh, where uh, red green uh, amber shows completed not completed in progress and uh, things like that uh, and then you have uh, used an images for it it's gonna make your page really heavy so uh, important takeaway is replace it by css uh, as much as possible and uh, even if you need to use an image uh, try to reduce the size uh, try to uh, zip it compress it there are tools available so that is an important point we need to do uh, <clears throat> uh, the second mistake i see a lot of developers does is uh, they write in a plain query is always and then what they do is when the data is out of the query, so general trend is writing in a query, select ID name from account where this, that's all. Now what they do is all the operations, right? Ag aggregate, let's say you need to do an, a sum of all the revenue of an account where, uh, or opportunities where let's say stages negotiating, uh, things like that. What they'll do is they'll write in a query, then they'll write in a method and in that uh, they will calculate it. So what it does it, uh, first of all, it will, uh, your query anyway gonna take on a time and then your method will take on iterations around it and then we'll calculate that function 
So what you can tell your developers is, uh, please get rid of those kind of uh, scenarios. If possible, any calculation which your query can do for you, please make sure you do it inside it. If it's not, then definitely you have an Apex and a powerful engine and a machine to do it. So these are the two important things I thought of sharing with you guys. Uh, I'm sure you will be doing this as part of an code review, but if not, please pay attention to these two things. Uh, the third one is also on a perform filters in SQL first and then in Apex and then finally in Visual for Space. So that is an extension of the point. Uh, use standard set controller built in pagination. So if you want to do an a pagination, make use of this controller rather than you make your own methods and do a paginations around it. Uh, the fourth next point is also not many developers does it. And I have seen a project where all the classes are written like that. I think as part of sharing visibility, we have covered this topic in detail talking about uh, sharing with how important it is because if your query is written uh, like that it may have uh, access to a larger data volume however your your users may not want to see all those unwanted data so if you use sharing with it will definitely uh, reduce the amount of data you want to see amount of data uh, your program should query so make sure uh, you should not have an, a single class or not single, but you should have majority of the classes with sharing. Uh, lazy loading is in a technique. So this with what concept talks about is uh, uh, the the important part of page load first, and then the content inside it. Anyway, you can load it uh, later. So make use of it. Uh, uh, use filters and pagination. So this again is an important concept. I think there wasn't a time. This wasn't a question asked in the interviews most that if you have a large amount of data how would you like to show it on a page so if you have a large amount of data we know that uh, we should do an paginations uh, in a way that we should show the last data or the relevant data and user can anyway play around it to find it uh, reduce the number of database queries and uh, records being used uh, do not use dml operations inside the loop which is very common uh, static resource have a build in caching features. So this is uh, sometime our developers don't follow it. Uh, so if you see uh, anything uh, like CSS, your JS, uh, your images and things like that can go into a static resource. Make sure that you put it uh, in the static resource. Uh, optimizing polling function. Um, I don't know if you have used it, but what this function does it Request on a particular interval to your controller. So uh, I have only used it in one scenario in my life. Uh, I don't know if you have used it, but our scenario was that uh, uh, if you are making an, a payment, uh, then your page should keep checking that whether the payment has been done or not. And if the payment is not done, do not uh, end up users to showing the failure page, make sure that you make an, a call out to payment system by using that transaction and see if the response is being lost. So you call that system and uh, using that transaction, so the payment details so that a user gets in a confidence because we all get nervous when it comes to the payment. So that is where I have used this uh, polling function. Uh, but uh, what Salesforce says is because it will keep engaging your resources right up and through it will be calling the methods. Uh, try to uh, have an, a longer intervals than the shorter intervals. Uh, majority of the developer does this mistake. Uh, so if you see, we put a lot of HTMLs to our visual projects, um, and then uh, that also causes a problem. So remove unnecessary HTMLs from your page if possible, combine all CSS. So these are the general things which uh, we do. Uh, the last point I would like to highlight, I don't know if you have used it, but I uh, personally recommend it uh, by having in a process that uh, if your Visual Force page is designed to create an update records, which does not need bouncing the triggers behind, uh, make sure you have a control logic that when a Visual Force page uh, hit a record and that doesn't need all the triggers to be bounced, workflows to be bounced, process builder to be bounced, uh, you control it. Uh, uh, it should not do that. I don't know if you have used it, this in, in your project. So these are the important things which I thought uh, are good to discuss uh, from a Visual Force 
performance perspective now i'll take a pause here uh, i know because almost everyone all of us on the call have worked on it uh, any other important topic which you want to discuss which i missed here on about visual force performance or you have done some other uh, and then you want to share from that perspective Manman, there's one thing which Salesforce recently updated in critical updates. Salesforce recently has come up with a Salesforce Edge, uh, which is to reduce network latency. Mm -hmm. So it is available in critical update. Okay. It will be anyways enforced, I think, by July 2020 uh, for all the orgs. That's also one thing which uh, Salesforce recently came up with. Okay. And how does it helps? Uh, so I think uh, even I don't have much details. Uh, okay. About it, but uh, what I understood that it is creating uh, a kind of a static, uh, or let's say copy of static um, things on different um, data servers, not only the one where you are located, but also in the, in a particular regions from where your users are uh, calling this instance. And by that it is reducing some time yeah no makes sense okay so we'll go through it thanks for highlighting that feature uh, i will try to read it myself uh, anything else uh, anybody want to add it vinay hari or anyone on the call yeah uh, this is Tark speaking i i just want to uh, if you can give more details about the uh, not the last point the the point before build custom versions of JavaScript li libraries with only the functions you ah, need. Okay. So what I mean over here is, for example, let's say uh, you are using jQuery, right? And now jQuery JavaScript libraries are really, really big and large. And you may be using one portion of it, but then if you put uh, into your static resource or you include those JavaScript libraries into your page, what program will try to do is it will try to load everything right and that is where it will make the page heavy and the it will increase the loading time so what ideal recommendation is any css library or javascript library which you are using on your page uh, if you can optimize it uh, optimize it in a way that uh, the portion which you are using it will make uh, uh, impact to your page performance let's say so the the uh, visual first page will upload or will charge all the content of the libraries uh, that so we are we are using it will definitely put it into the cache yeah okay so it will eat up some of your memory so if if you are running short with the heap size then it may have an impact issue uh, if the heap size is big, then you may not uh, notice the uh, uh, difference. Uh, I don't know if somebody on the call having an experience uh, adding a lot of libraries and seeing the performance issue, but this is a very important uh, uh, thing to do. I personally feel that you should not use big CSS libraries, JavaScript libraries to your page, uh, because then definitely it will eat up your heap size. Okay, uh, last point is also important. So if you have not done it, definitely make use of it. Uh, it will help uh, reducing your system's performance uh, and improving your page performance as well. Okay, now moving to the next. Uh, these are again the same thing. Uh, uh, we are using it from many, many years uh, and we all know about it, but just because it's part of an syllabus, uh, uh, I just thought of keeping some of the important points here. So the first point is for Apex and triggers is, of course, use configuration instead of a code if at all possible. So do not jump into the code. Uh, make sure you definitely look at the possibility of using it through an optimization through the configuration. Uh, I'm sure 90 percent of the developers don't use map uh, what they do is they query the list and then iterate it through and then create the map so uh, this is the one common 
most of the developers doing it. So when I review the code, I try to help them understanding that uh, Salesforce can give you a map right away when you write in a query. Uh, so therefore, you need not to write in a loop to make it. Second common mistakes most of the developers do is uh, they generally copy paste the query from somewhere or they just go to the query builder tools, which gives you all uh, uh, kind of an, uh, uh, suggestions with the fields. And what they'll do is they'll click, 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 and then they build the, the, the queries with the fields, which some of the fields are not required. And those are still part of the queries, or they will go to a method which is already existing and copy paste the queries from there without looking into the fields, even though they need an ID and a name. If the query has 20 fields, they will query the entire they'll copy the entire query and put it so that also should be uh, uh, should be important that we need to understand that each field uh, we write it to query it makes the query heavier uh, it makes the query to to run longer and also it uh, comes back it will take an eyes in your memory in your heap which will overall slow down your performance so uh, uh, first two things I have seen developers not following it so definitely an important point uh, from a performance uh, perspective uh, bulkify is something which most of the guys uh, if they are a little bit uh, senior developers uh, they all follow it so we all know that there is an a uh, always code should be bulkify single triggers per object uh, sql queries uh, for an uh, you can uh, on a previous uh, page i think on the previous uh, slide we have covered it uh, if you are writing queries, large queries, uh, data set, you can put it in the for loop, uh, inside the, not inside the for loop, but in the for loop, uh, avoid SQL injection. This is also an, a, a point where, which we have covered on sharing visibility in detail. Uh, query child with a parent is definitely some of the developers never uh, follow that practice. They first query the parent. So if they need an account and an opportunity, they'll query a They'll take the account ID and they'll query the contact uh, and then they'll query the opportunities. So all these can be combined into one, but generally uh, the guys does it in a, in a multiple way that also can cause performance issues. Uh, future methods, I have seen very, very rarely guys are using it, uh, but it makes a lot of sense. So anything which doesn't need uh, immediate reflection to your code, uh, make sure you put that method as future. I personally use it a lot of time. I have fixed so many too many SQL queries issues because of the future method. Uh, uh, was working for an, a telecom project uh, where the project was heavily customized. Uh, it was that customized that the, the maximum Apex code limit was reached and uh, we were having a lot of performance issue. So future method made my life easy as a solution designer. Uh, make journal apis so i what i tell my developers is when you write in a method uh, do not write it uh, right away from an uh, 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 perspective try to make a generic api and then use those apis uh, generic methods uh, or utility methods uh, into your program specific to your requirement. And then once you build your APIs, uh, make use every time uh, when you go to write a method, look at in your API list and see if that similar method is already available. It reduces your overall uh, number of lines of code in the production, but also uh, it saves your time in terms of uh, your development cost, in terms of your test classes coverage and things like that. So. I see most of the guys are not doing it. You tell the developer they will never look what they have in the system. Uh, I have seen at least uh, 30, 40 utility classes in the in the production with the different names doing the same function. So <clears throat> code reusability is a very important thing. Uh, uh, exception handling is something which can also improve your performance uh, uh, because if your exceptions are not caught correctly, if those are not defined correctly, it will have a performance impact. So uh, make sure that you do it. Uh, do not write too many comments. Uh, I don't, I find it interesting when I was reading yesterday. So if you write too many debug logs, uh, uh, so before I go there, if possible, bypass the other triggers to execute. So if when you have an, a trigger handler and you are updating one particular object, and if you don't want all the around triggers to be bounced, uh, you can also control it by a flag. So have some mechanism where you can bypass the other triggers. Uh, 
Now, the interesting point over here is uh, debug logs. Guys, do you think writing debug logs can slow down your performance? Anybody have seen this? I was reading a very interesting article yesterday and uh, one of the guy, what he has done is, uh, he has taken a two different classes uh, where he has written some generic code and the other classes, he has written a code with a lot of debug and the the uh, the log inspector which we were talking first right that how you see which method has taken how much of execution time. what he has done is he has taken a multiple samples like that and as per his analysis what he, he said is if you write too many too much debug logs it may slow down your system performance as well and i really liked that article it was very good to read so the crux of that article was uh, developers have a habit of sometimes not writing the debug logs or developer even I wasn't a developer who used to write a lot of debug logs because that helps when your code goes to the production. Uh, so make sure that you write the balanced debug logs. Uh, too many debug logs can also impact your performance. Uh, there is an, a limit class. I don't know uh, how many of you have used it. Uh, in my project, I have made an API out of it. Uh, we have made some functions out of it. Uh, so make sure that you always use your limit class. Uh, it will tell you the thresholds uh, because if you do not set your threshold, you will never know that you are about to crash. So very, very important uh, for in a project which are medium complex and in a complex or in a large, you set up your uh, uh, limit APIs correctly. Use uh, uh, sorry, you set up your uh, limit uh, uh, check correctly and if possible have a framework which can uh, set up a notifications we can we can which can tell you maybe you can rather than notification you can log a uh, uh, you can log a ticket you can log a task you can create some of the logs in the custom object and you can review it this will definitely tell you that you are near the threshold and any new development which is going to production will not crash down your production because your test may run in staging and and in a developer sandbox but when it goes to the production it may crash if you don't pay attention to it and this will be right away p1 in the production so if you don't have set up this uh, then definitely this is is an important thing to do it uh, you can set up out of the box governor limits warnings, uh, uh, which is available out of the box. Uh, do not query same data multiple times. So this is what I was setting, telling you that um, uh, if you have a method uh, and if you have queries done on the previous method, and again you are calling a different method, there also you are making a query. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Uh, you can pass the data. Uh, the second last point is also important this also i have used it in my project to fix to many sql queries is uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, information you can get it from uh, user info context uh, what developers have and have it is they will write in a query for that on a user object so uh, things which you can get it from the context right away you need not to write in a query for it uh, and the last point and important point is Cache is a very important feature. I personally use it most of the time if there is an opportunity. Use cache. Uh, Salesforce provides you 10 MB of cache and uh, uh, in few scenarios, it can be a lifesaver. So I definitely use it to uh, make use of that. So these about uh, some of the important uh, optimizing Apex triggers best practices I wanted to share with you. Uh, again, I'll take a pause here. Uh, anybody want to add something or share their experience? Yeah. Okay, uh, so looks generic. Now, next topic is very interesting, and I really want to have a discuss around it. Uh, I want Hari, Vinay, uh, Abhishek, everyone to open uh, and discuss on this. So guys if you if you want to if you need to do an automation right you can do it by process builder you can do it by workflow you can do it by trigger right what do you think what should what should should be used all three should be used only two or should be only use one and uh, which one do you think is the is the best thing to use because if you use all three let me tell you you are in mess 
Man, man, this is uh, Fergal here. Um, this is a funny one because an awful lot of us historically use the workflow and uh, we were told by Salesforce never use the workflow. But if you look at people like David Liu and stuff like that, there's always a specific place to use workflow. A lot of people are looking to now use that just completely not use it anymore. So it is an interesting one because for me, it was always very simple, straightforward. Um, and now everyone is saying, put everything in the process builder and everything can be put in there, but there must be a place for, for workflow. Otherwise Salesforce would have taken it out. Yeah, exactly. Yes, there is, there is, there is, is in a line where you need to understand that, uh, where you should follow process builder workflows and trigger. And I tried to put my perspective around it. Uh, I have not done a regressive test, uh, so that, uh, but based on my experience, uh, uh, as in a developer, as in a senior developer, I have put my perspective, but, uh, I would like to, as I said, right, I have not done test around it. Uh, I can, I can speak based on the conceptual knowledge I have, but then if somebody has done a test around it, I think it would be a very good, uh, interesting topic and a take away from the session. So anybody, uh, uh, as right, uh, uh, you know that uh, workflows are a little bit, it was used historically, we have a process builder. So what I personally feel is, and I have seen this problem with workflows is, if you have a workflow for an update, that is something which you should really pay attention. So any historical workflow where you have an update action, you need to take that update action out or you migrate it either to your trigger or you migrate it to your process builder if you have because what it does it uh, if you go to the order of execution and if you see that your trigger is updating a record and then it will go to a workflow and workflow will an update and a record and that will again go back to a trigger and it will call the before trigger and after trigger and uh, then you have in a process builder which will also update after uh, the record is saved and which may again cause in a trigger to bounce well a lot of things will happen behind and you will never know how many times one single class will bounce so uh, the important thing is you can still retain your workflows which are doing the rest of the jobs like sending an email making uh, uh, call outs uh, service call outs but field update is something which you should really pay attention to. If you have a trigger on that object, any workflow which is doing in a field update, please take it out and put it to uh, the process builder or to uh, your uh, before trigger. Guys, any comment on that or anyone want to share anything? I think um, no, what you said is absolutely correct. Uh, normally, that's something which also uh, I am doing to some extent. We are keeping only email alerts and outbound messages to workflow, cash everything to process builder or trigger, uh, depending upon uh, what we want to achieve. Yeah. But um, I, I want to highlight one more point over here. But the process builder for object, you can have only one single process builder, then you have to build the whole logic around it. Yeah. So this actually brings extra burden to the build team because the thing is you are uh, changing the single process builder and every single logic which is around the process builder needs to be checked when it goes into process. So that is something which is a, 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 a thing which, which I have encountered and we already face a couple of surprises. So, that's, uh, I agree with that completely, Harry. And uh, what you find now is that the, the people who have said to us, uh, go and uh, take everything out of workflow, the automation which is required in each um, in each object becomes vast. So instead of you having, you know, what was simple, okay, here are a few workflows, you now have multiple, um, multiple uh, uh, issues within creating that new automation in the process builder which then has to be linked back to triggers and everything else. Yes. So now the next slide will try to do a trade off between two, right? So now we know that on the previous slide, we agree that triggers with field update either should go to process builder or go to trigger. Now, you know that there are pain points which Hari highlighted, right? That 
uh, if you have an, a, a bigger organization and you have done a lot of automation specifically on a key objects for example opportunities and account then even if you want to add in a, a condition a small condition you need to drill down the entire process builder and then you need to test it everything so your regression testing anyway will will take on a longer time and till the time you don't do run the regression shoot you may not get or gain the confidence so question is process builder versus trigger right now salesforce always will push you to use in a process builder because that is the out of the box comp uh, features uh, you need not to write in a code and triggers is something which is being loved by developer uh, i personally love triggers over process builder because i can debug it more easily rather than debugging the process builder it's uh, those salesforce has put a lot of effort giving the logs which now uh, are helpful but still my my first love is trigger so definitely i'll go for a trigger so this uh, there is an article which i have given a reference below uh, and, uh, comparison of all three uh, i have taken this screenshot from there so what process we need to understand is process builder can only and only handle dml if it executes after record is created or updated so right away it will only and only work when it is created or updated triggers will give you flexibility of all right it can give you before after it can you do delete and delete and things like that so it means triggers already having an upper hand in certain scenario uh, like the second point says the process builder cannot handle delete and un delete and then the third point i have already covered telling that if there are errors and error handling uh, is good process builder is is give you the the failure of all or none apex can have an a parcel success where you can make your old db operations right and then rest of the important point which i'll not go through so can I also bring in a point in this memo, and which is that Salesforce is also pushing all of people who don't necessarily have the the, the full developer uh, experience to use Flow within the the process builder. So a lot of uh, I know that you haven't put it down here, but there's a lot of people who are actually saying, no, 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 don't do the trigger. Let's go and uh, and and start with Flow, um, and and that's something as well which creates extra. Um, I think there's a lack of clarity in 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 how to deal with some of these com complex issues because Salesforce will push flow even above triggers sometimes. Yes, you are right. So that angle I have not added, but you are right. So there is a confusion that we should do. So what I have done is based on my understanding, I have come up with the the recommendation is, and and the rest of the guys can add to it is. So your first step should be to see if your process builder can do it because that is where the Salesforce says you should go ahead. It they take a responsibility of the environment, and then over the time it will get mature. So uh, definitely the first step you should check is your process builder. Uh, the second step is you should check if your process builder is not able to do something. Then you check with your workflows. And the last step is. Only for before update or delete and undelete operations, you should rely on the triggers. Uh, anything beyond that, you should definitely try to do it with the process builders and flow together. I totally agree with you. This is this is the approach we should take, it. and this is the approach we are taking it. Yeah, to be honest. Yeah. And um, I, I also want to put one more point over here. The non-developers, people who don't know code, process builder is something you can achieve nearly nearly everything. Yes. I, just believe me, you can achieve nearly everything. You won't need coding sprites at all. Yeah, thanks, Harry. So follow these steps, step one, two, three. Uh, and then from a performance, because our topic is performance, I have also thought from not from the uh, recommendation pro perspective, but from the the uh, performance perspective, uh, I have read the article. I am telling it again. I have not done test myself. It is based on what I have on the uh, articles. Uh, some of the articles suggest that performance if you're really looking for a performance your your trigger can give you a better performance in certain scenarios than your process builder so this is all about uh, 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 your steps in terms of how you will achieve the automation and the performance part of it okay now uh, 
let's talk a little bit about so any any other question on it before i go we have two more topics to cover and then i think we are done for the day there is any question on this okay now we also see the guys talks about reporting um, the best practices and the um, things like that some of the reports sometime query time out sometime takes too longer sometime we schedule the reports reports doesn't read to the person and things like that uh, i also want to highlight here the salesforce reporting engine is anyway is not very good so um, it cannot offer you lot many things still working on it from an uh, einstein analytics and from that perspective but uh, the normal salesforce engine is anyway does not offer a lot of features but even if you have an a report performance make sure that your filters are very important so make sure your your uh, if it is in a custom report type make sure that you look at the report type and see uh, uh, you have all the fields and you are not referring uh, the fields through lookup but you are referring the field uh, by a relationship uh, and then filter out unnecessary data make sure your filters again right like soqls this is reporting is also the same thing uh, make sure you're using equals instead of contains you are not using not equal instead of does not contain uh, remove columns which are not required which will make your report heavy so if any field you don't want to see on the report or you you see it doesn't make value to it uh, remove it hide those details uh, if you need a formula field on a combination of two or three fields do not try to create a formula on a report it it slow down the performance uh, if if your report is targeting too much of data uh, in that case the workaround would be create a formula field in a salesforce on an object and refer it uh, uh, so the same thing these points are same uh, bucket can also slow down your report uh, bucket is a feature which i like most i use it most of the times uh, uh, sometimes there are a lot of pick list values and you don't want to put a graph on each of the value bucket definitely helps but salesforce says if you bucket it and you are running a large amount of data it can slow down it uh, so well, that can impact the performance uh, schedule reports on off peak hours that can help uh, sometime improving the performance because at that time salesforce resources would be free uh, and then you may have an, a better performance of the reports so any data which may be going to the users let's say uh, uh, after the office hours maybe 6 pm you can schedule it to 11 pm and 12 pm again be careful because when you schedule the data you may have a difference of volumetrics by that time so if possible schedule it during the off peak hours if it is doesn't make sense uh, or doesn't make difference to your data in a filter use index field and do not add too many fields via lookup relationship so that was on a first part of it when you are creating a report type so these are the general uh, report performance uh, you can follow it uh, the same can applicable for the dashboard as well uh, this topic is being already covered by bhavna uh, i am covering it one more time so what it says is uh, if you are doing a reorg like where you are changing a lot of your uh, territories you are changing your role hierarchies uh, you are maybe rewriting all your sharing rules one more time uh, and you are changing a lot of users and a group things like that make sure that you enable a feature called defer sharing calculation this feature is not available out of the box uh, you call salesforce enable this feature defer your sharing calculation and then make all your or calculation or your rules and then come and click on recalculate uh, otherwise your system will lock down and it may take on a longer time to perform all these steps so this has already covered on the previous session i just wanted to touch base again that keep that in mind that if you are doing a reorg kind of a thing rewriting your sharing rules your territories your role this feature can save your life from a performance perspective uh, and then uh, our last topic for the day uh, about performance tuning for large data loading. So uh, some of these points I think Vinay covered during some of the sessions previously. Uh, but uh, data loading is again a pain. Uh, I am sure you must have gone through it at some point of your time within Salesforce. Uh, what we recommend is or what uh, Salesforce recommend in that case is uh, first of all you 
so i will not go through the steps which are generic right in terms of a recommendation that analyze your data know your data talk to your business all those things i will not talk about uh, those are the general things you can get it on a lot of article but i will little bit touch about your technical part of it so uh, when you load your data uh, it will uh, uh, bounce a lot of triggers validation workflows emails uh, and then things like that. So make sure you have an, a custom setting uh, to bypass for a data loading user so that it does not impact or does not bounce all other processes behind it. That is in a one bottom line. If you're dealing with the large data, if you're loading 100, 200 records, it may okay. But if you're loading the large data, I'm sure that majority of the data will fail if these are not done correctly. So trigger should be off, process builder should be off, off your your workflow should be off your validation rule should be switched off now when i say validation rule should be switched off it does not mean that you push the bad data into the system uh, i am assuming that you will have a tool which will take care of the data quality and things like that and then you put up the right hierarchy so these are the steps which you will take care uh, and it will improve your data loading performance then you should know that there is in a bulk API limits set that how many uh, uh, batches you can have in a day. Uh, you also need to keep an eye on that your rolling 24 window API limits based on your license, based on a user that you must keep in your mind. Otherwise, your loading will fail and it will have a bad performance. Uh, you must need to split the data into smaller uh, pieces, waves, so that uh, it can load. Now, when you make it in a smaller uh, uh, batches, make sure you uh, club the data in a relationship. For example, right when you're loading the parents and the child, parents should go first, child should go late. If you load the child first, parents are not there, it will fail. So those are the general things. So make sure you split your data smartly. Uh, you always pay attention that your data SQ can happen, which is an ownership and a lookup. Uh, that uh, you should not uh, refer to too many lookups to an SM records. Uh, uh, more than same user should not be owning the data loading records. Make sure that you have that. These two topics also, I think Bhavna covered on her previous sessions in detail, talking about that how you can get rid of these two uh, problems. Uh, if you have an parent child records loading together, then it's fine. But if those are loading in a different parallel transactions, you will have a problem to unable to lock row. So be careful again, right? When you are splitting your data uh, to improve your data loading performance, put it into the same group. Uh, load it off peak hours so that no impact to live users. So if your application is being already live, maybe for a pilot users, maybe for a subset of the users, when you load a data and uh, you are maybe updating the transactional data sometime, they also try to update it and they may have a bad experience that uh, the record is not saved, not available for them, uh, things like that may come. Uh, the other key fields, uh, there are a lot many, but what I could have think of uh, immediately is pick list, phone, currency, owner, sell, uh, reference to uh, other key fields, minimum and max length. These are the the important considerations for under data loading. And anyway, duplicate check data quality you need to do to make sure that uh, uh, it is not impacting your overall data loading. So these are the few points from a data loading performance perspective you need to keep in mind. Um, and then uh, there are a lot more uh, about to know how to successfully migrate from an legacy data to Salesforce, and then six step of uh, good data migration, which talks about more over uh, process uh, prospect of it, which I have not covered. These are the technical aspect of an uh, data loading performance tuning, which I have covered here. Now I'll take a pause here, and I will I will take a question if there is a question for me. My man uh, Fergal here. Just a quick question for you. So uh, you you do the all of the data preparation outside of of Salesforce. You transfer it in, and then the moment that you reactivate uh, everything, so you reactivate triggers, and workflow, process, yeah. the rest of it. Um, that means that any new updated uh, data will be affected. Um, I, I, I missed uh, one of the. It, it may have been uh, discussed in one of the earlier um, uh, meetings before, but um, is it at that point that you would use like a um, a post implementation or post date implementation to like a validity tool to actually then reassess because you you can't do any of the out of um, out of the box tools 
with the initial uh, transfer? Is it that point that you would then use like a, a validity tool to to look at merging? Um, because a lot of the time it, there will be an issue at that point. So I'm so, talking specifically around, let's say, contacts or accounts, duplications that, um, or things that would have blocked, but uh, now um, now are in the system. So at, at what type of tooling is then needed? Manmohan, can I answer that question? <laughs> Vinay, okay, okay, Vinay, go ahead. The first thing is that, okay, when you are trying to bring the data from outside, uh, it is, uh, need to make sure that you are removing the duplicates and all those things before bringing the data into the uh, and to do that one there are many tools available uh, but when you're bringing the data of course you're switching up the triggers and other you are making sure that the data quality is good before you bring the data in that you need to find the switching example I can give the ETL tool you bring the data from Salesforce to outside okay, into the ETL you bring other external data bring it into the ETL okay, doing the mismatching and all this within the ETL tool and then you are bringing data I, I, I get it uh, Vinay so so basically the responsibility is to get all of the data correct before the transfer it comes over um, I think the the reason why I'm looking at it from a performance perspective is let's say that the um, the moment that the the triggers are turned back on again the workflow process rules validation rules is it at that point that I can expect that there there may be some additional work to do from a performance perspective. Yeah, so Vinay, you are kind of breaking off, so I am not sure everyone heard you well. Is it better now? Yes, much better, better, please. Okay. Yeah, if you can just say one more time, please. Okay, sure. Okay, so when you are bringing the whole better there, okay, there will not be an event we switch on the triggers and everything. They will be invoked again when you have a records get created so after that, I don't expect performance issue because even if you switch on a triggers and all that uh, it will not automatically start uh, uh, and uh, it will creating a mess and a performance issue in a cell force over there so I was a part of the one of the big uh, migration the six million records we exactly did the same migrated you other because in the yeah is, is it better now yeah you when you are starting it's good but somewhere in okay. between it goes off okay uh, okay i hope it is better it's just a mic in front of okay uh, okay yeah 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 so we heard you saying that you were part of a six million migration so we heard you till that yeah okay so it was a user migration and a user migration the biggest problem is that it takes a bit more time across global region because where the login and authentication happens for the user over there uh, compared to the account and contact so we did exactly the same step uh, stopping the, uh, the user object of course account and contact related stops around that part but uh, later on there was no into this force okay and if you take all those calculation outside of Salesforce before migration, I think that's the best step to do. Yeah, definitely. So I would definitely say that, you know, approach is better where you pay attention, clean everything right before putting it to Salesforce as much as possible. And then you can also have a reactive approach as well, right? When you are not sure that you have a multiple channels and still data will come to the performance from the Salesforce. So you can have a tool to measure it as well but better to do it on outside itself thanks guys yeah okay any other uh, question thank you Vinay, for covering that yeah, yeah 
one more, not a question, but a few concept, okay, with respect to the performance tuning quickly, okay, I won't too much time. Uh, the first of all, the skinny table, we already discussed that one, okay, if we have a requirement to have the reporting on a large set of data. Okay, make use of skinny tables. Uh, there is already reference in the previous slides and sessions regarding the skinny tables around that one, which is nothing but a copy of the uh, the uh, standard and custom objects, a few fields, okay, into the uh, kind of a custom object behind the scene. You need to request to Salesforce for that one, and you can have a custom index as well that one uh, that will uh, improve the performance of the overall reporting if you have a reporting need and where the large data volume comes in a picture over there. the second part you also think about using a division in a cell force for example uh, region wide segregation of the data so there is a concept of division in the cell force uh, with the data migration point of view, you can also think about a PK chunking. So when you are querying a multi million uh, millions of records, also make use of a PK chunking on a bulk API, uh, so that uh, you can split the parameter and your data will be split into the uh, multiple XML files uh, by Salesforce automatically on that one. So just make sure that you think about that one. We talked about a defer sharing rule calculation. Uh, always defer that one, but also make sure that when you have records, okay, uh, without any ownerships, so try to assign a system user to them, and which should be in a lower in the hierarchy. Uh, should be it does not it should have a role in the role hierarchy, or is at the top of the role hierarchy, so that the defer calculation you know, will not work on that part. But over there so those are the important uh, steps okay uh, around the um, uh, the uh, the performance tuning of the uh, within a cell force they done something like a security or performance test plan can be executed but you need to notify cell force for that one if you are going to do that one and also a uh, few things very important i will which are really i will put that one into the so with the flashing that one we're talking about org level action level i thought one trail had already available one moment yeah thank you very much vinay for adding all those valuable points uh, so guys uh, uh, anyone else also want to add anything based on their experience okay if there is nothing much uh, then uh, uh, just to have a quick look about our sessions all uh, the sessions are done uh, as i said right uh, for next two days we will try to get your responses if you want to uh, cover any topic otherwise our core team myself hari vinay and bhavna will sit together and see the topics uh, which we want to to do uh, revise one more time and then uh, and then we'll try to cover the next two sessions so uh, the idea is to get an uh, application certification when we started this series uh, by end of this year i have already scheduled my exam on 27th so uh, so go through all these sessions next uh, revision session would be done by uh, hari uh, you have already heard him on the call um, a person with a lot of knowledge a lot of salesforce experience and i'm sure um, um, going to have in a very nice session a revision session next time so till then uh, thank you very much and god bless goodbye enjoy your remaining weekend and thank you very much for your support your love uh, your motivation uh, uh, please do share feedback uh, for our speakers they really spend a lot of time uh, and uh, i also want to thank hari vinay bhavna for I know it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort to read and present. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, our speakers. Goodbye and God bless. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.